Thank you guys so much for being here today. I, obviously, I love talking about concussions. So I've been doing this for quite some time with Dr. Martino. So um, this project uh, we've been working on for many years together. So um, it started off as something very small and, and over the years, over the past five years, it's just really developed. So I'm really excited to share it with you guys today. So first, I kind of just wanted to go over um, a few things about, you know, concussions. But I wanted to start with this quote. So um, it, this was said in 1973 by a German football coach. So I thought it was really interesting that this was said in 1973 when we just did not even realize that sports injuries could affect children for their lifetime. So I just thought it was very interesting that um, the long-term consequences weren't even in his head when he said this. So forgive me for reading it directly, but it's a quote. So um, this is from Richard Snyder. If you had a son, would you encourage or permit him to play football? The carefully considered answer has been, if the boy was of high school age or older, and with proper physique, conditioning, and balanced mental capacity, if the boy was supplied with proper protective equipment, if he were to be taught the proper coaching techniques, with the avoidance of stick blocking or spearing, if his coach was a perceptive, thoughtful man, who regarded each lad as his own son, if the boy had the desire, then I would encourage him to play football. So of course, if all of these things are in place, then the answer is yes. We want our youth and we want our um, athletes to, to play sports. It's good for them. It's good a team approach. It's a good, uh, it's a good way to learn character and things like that. But we have to do it safely. So as we know, children who play football and hockey and lacrosse and all other sports run the risk of anybody, like anybody does, of long-term health consequences if we don't do it safely. So it's definitely not a no, but we have to be safe in doing that, and that's why we're all here today, so that we can do that. So what's the evolution of concussion understanding? So the relationship between contact sports and injury is well known. It's been known since the 1800s. So it's not just head injuries, it's any kind of injury. You can sprain your ankle, you can break your leg, you can break your arm. All of those things we know when we go to play a contact sport that that's, that's a risk, you know, that that's something that can happen. But we teach them how to play appropriately, we teach them how to use the proper equipment in hopes that something like that doesn't happen. So protective equipment has evolved over time. We know helmets and pads and things like that. A very long time ago, football helmets were just kind of a leather hat that went on top of their head. I'm not really sure exactly what that did, but they wore it all the same. So, and now we have really cool helmets that are able to uh, measure the velocity of a hit that you may take to the head while you're playing football. So, so as you can see, that's evolved tremendously over, over the years. So in the later half of the 20th century, it offered great in advancements in the understanding of what concussions are and what they are not. So used to we thought, well, they have to lose consciousness. They have to pass out in order for it to be considered a concussion. Well, now we know that these very obscure symptoms like a decrease in sleep or an increase in sleep or emotional liability or um, mood swings and stuff like that all are actually cons are, um, symptoms of concussions. So not just that initial bump to the head and then they pass out. They actually don't have to do that. So we've made huge advancements in understanding what a concussion actually looks like. So with the improvement in this insight came major changes in concussion education and, and what are required for concussion education now. So let's talk a little bit about that concussion education. So in the pre-21st century, there was no required education at all. So there's inconsistent education. Sometimes they talked about it, sometimes they didn't. They said, oh, it's a bell ringer, it's fine. As long as, they're, you know, as long as they didn't fall out on the field, they can go right back in or whatever. So now we know that that's not actually the case. So in the early 2000s, there was drastic increases in the introduction of um, legislation. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard, if you're kind of in the concussion world, of a little boy in Washington state who really prompted all of the legislation that surrounds concussions. So he was actually, in a football game. He was very good at football. And he um, had a head injury on the field. And he came off the field. And then a few minutes later, five, 10 minutes later, went back out on the field. And he was hit again in the end zone as he went to make a touchdown. And he didn't get back up at that time. 
So after that, this, this little boy was about 15 years old and um, he did survive, but he was in the hospital in an ICU setting for months and months and he's had to relearn how to um, use his voice a little bit. He's, he's not able to talk all the way, but a little bit. I used to have a video of him on here, but it just, it just was taking too long. So, um, but he's, in, he's wheelchair bound, but he loves to spread his message of safety. Not a message of don't play football, don't play sports. It's a message of safety instead. So he's really what prompted the whole legislation around concussion education. But even with that legislation, we did inconsistent education. So I'll never forget when my little brother was playing football in, in the high school setting, and this legislation had just come out, and so I was very interested in it. You know, so my dad came home from the football meeting, and my little brother's much younger than me. But um, anyway, I'm not going to age myself. But um, anyway, he, um, he came home, and I was asking my dad, I'm like, so, Dad, what did they say about concussions tonight? You know, you went to the meeting tonight. He's like, oh, they didn't talk about that. I was like, well, they have to talk about that. That's what the legislation says. There's a law that says they have to do that. And he's like, oh, I don't know. I mean, they were just talking about the games and the uniforms, and I signed a few pieces of paper, and I left. And I was like, oh, okay. So I, I had him go and get the pieces of paper that he had signed that night, and one of them, it did. It said concussions, and that there was a risk for concussions um, if you played football, and these are the signs and symptoms to look for, and please let your coach or your athletic trainer know if you know, and this was years ago, so this was right when the legislation first came out. So, um, so that was kind of how the education was inconsistent, these one-page handouts um, that they were given. So currently we have, you know, over the years we have evolved, and um, current national education programs are huge. They've made huge advancements in the different types of education that is given. There's a greater emphasis on educating all stakeholders. So used to it was just the athlete or just the athletic trainer, which still plays a huge role in concussions and concussion education the athletic trainer does. But um, now we're going to educate the parents. We're going to educate the coaches. We're going to educate the athletic trainers <clears throat> who already are very well versed in concussions. Um, and also the players too, so that everyone has an understanding of what to look for so that we can all participate as a team in trying to you know, take care of these athletes. So much improvements, a lot more aggressive um, as far as education goes. So let's talk a little bit about the health burden of concussions. So the statistics right now are 1.6 to 3.8 million sports and recreation concussions um, each year. And 80% of those go unreported. So that is the problem, is the underreporting of concussions. Because if we don't know about it, we can't take care of it. So that is really where, where we're trying to go with the education, is to get these athletes to report these concussions. So there's about 3 million youth football players, and this is just football alone, okay? We'll get into the other sports in just a few minutes, but just football alone, there are 3 million youth athletes and about a million um, high school athletes and about 70,000 college level athletes as far as just football. So that's over four million athletes that are, are in this setting all the time. But we always talk about football. Everybody wants to talk about football when you talk about concussions, but actually our girls are the ones that are at our highest risk. So girls soccer, girls basketball, girls volleyball, those are the top three. And then football is, is number four. So lacrosse in areas, we don't have as much lacrosse. We are starting to get some, some great lacrosse teams around in the area, but um, that has been you know in, in different places for a long time. Hockey is also one that is very high up there on the list. So we have to think about all sports, cheerleading, a lot of people don't think about our cheerleaders, but when they throw them up in the air and then they fall, they're at a huge risk for concussion. So we're trying to make sure that we hit all of these, um, all of these different types of athletes. So how can we reduce that burden, the burden of concussions on our young athletes? So changing their attitudes. We have a culture, especially in the South, about be tough, get back out there, go play. That's always been the, the culture surrounding sports, especially football. Get back out there, you're fine, don't be a sissy, you're good, get back in there. You know, you're not, you're, you don't have blood coming out, you're good. You know, I know, I'm a nurse and, I, and I'm also a mom, so I say if they don't have fever and they're not vomiting, you're going to school. 
okay? So it's kind of like that with football, you know? It's kind of in, in soccer and whatever. They're like, if there's no blood, you're good, okay? So that's always been kind of the culture. So this really, this education is really a culture change is what we're, what we're trying to do is change that attitude of the players so that they know that it's okay to be hurt. I would rather come out this one game and be able to play the rest of the season than miss the entire season because I didn't come out when I needed to. So um, those are kind of the important things that we're trying to teach these players that you're not not tough or you're not not good because you had to come out. It's better to say that now. Imagine if you get hurt and you're feeling dizzy and you're not, you're kind of seeing stars and you go back in and you break your leg because you fell over or because you, you know, ran into somebody the wrong way and then you break your leg. Well, now you're out for the season. You know, a lot of times, not always, there's very specific protocols for it, but a lot of times we can get these patients with concussions back into the game a lot quicker if they come out right away than if they, you know, wait and keep going back in. Our sports rules, of course, are changing and evolving with the time. So, you know, different types of tackling and different ages for tackling. We have a, um, a great flag football program in Fairhope. I thought that's so cute. I went out and watched them the other day. I had a friend that has her son plays and I'm like, this is a good idea, you know. Um, so they're, you know, changing some of the rules as far as um, the way that you can tackle um, heading in soccer. Um, that's, you know, some rule changes with that. That, um, as well and then of course equipment too. A lot of institutions are taking over concussion education as a whole. You know, Mobile County Public School System adopted our program a couple of years ago and the entire county had to participate in the program. So, um, so as you can see, some corporations are doing it as a whole, you know, um, so that's always a good thing. Coaching behaviors as well. So there is research linked to that if the coach has a good and nurturing attitude about what a concussion is, that it actually prompts the players to be more truthful about their symptoms. So if the coach is like, no, guys, I need y'all to tell me, okay? You're doing this for your team if you tell that you have a concussion. It's for your team, kind of a team environment, that that actually does help the athletes feel more comfortable in um, you know, reporting their symptoms. And you'll see that on the video in just a little bit that I'm gonna show you. So, um, and then also the individual athletes, uh, their safety behavior. So um, telling about their concussion symptoms, the knowing the signs and symptoms of concussions, like we talked about earlier with the um, you don't just have to pass out there's all these other things that you could feel potentially um, also uh, being honest when they have a symptom so there was a study out there that talked about um, this was soccer boys soccer and um, they asked them would you tell if you had a concussion at what point would you tell and if what about this game what about this game what about this quarter or whatever um, as far as concussions go and of course all the boys are like oh yes absolutely I would definitely tell if I had a headache or I would definitely tell if I felt dizzy unless it's the championship game then of course I would not tell <laughs> you know and so you're like okay well you guys missed the boat on that one <laughs> so that's that's actually not what we were looking for so um so they need to understand that it's actually a little bit more important than than the championship game because they may have to miss that championship game but you know what they'll be back next year so they can play again um, instead of having to sit out forever and not be able to play again so um, those attitudes are changing too also being supportive of each other and looking out for each other. So you may have a student that a student athlete that's out on the field and they get hit. Say they hit their head on the soccer goal. We had a, um, a kid do that a couple years ago, hit their head on the soccer goal. They were going in for a slide or something. I don't know. And, um, and she hit her head and she, nobody really said anything. She didn't pass out or anything like that but one of her teammates actually saw her on the sideline being real weird, like, you know, kind of not acting like herself. And she went down to get her water bottle and she was a little unsteady and she ran back out on the field to go play. And her teammate was like, no, 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 something's wrong. Something's wrong, she's not acting like herself. And they pulled her out and she, she definitely had a concussion and she was sick for a couple of weeks. So, so it's, that's teaching them a team approach, a good environment for, um, for them to be able to tell, you know, that they have these going on. So all of these things are things that we're trying to, to change and trying to make better as far as concussion education goes. So what is CAP? And who is the CAP team? So the original members of the CAP team were um, Dr. Anthony Martino, who um, we were talking about earlier. He's the chair of neurosurgery here at USA. And um, he's also the sponsoring physician for Think First in Mobile. And we'll talk about what Think First is here in Mobile. And then also myself. So um, I, we already talked about, I'm a professor at the College of Nursing. I'm also a PMP in the Adolescent Health uh, USA, in USA Clinic here. So that kind of put us in a unique spot for this being something that we're 
we're very, very interested in. So um, I've always worked with adolescents and children and, um, and him being in neurosurgery, we kind of had a, an interest in the same thing. So um, I worked in neurosurgery in Atlanta for um, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and they had a comprehensive concussion clinic there and um, I was a nurse practitioner there as well. And um, so that kind of piqued my interest and I, I did see Dr. Martino speaking at one of these um, quite a few years ago and introduced myself and, and here we are. So. Um, so that's kind of how the program got started. So what were our initial attempts at con concussion education here in Mobile and the, the area? So think first is what we talked about before. This is actually injury prevention. So it's not just um, concussions and head injuries. It's also spinal cord injuries and things like that. And we've been to the Think First conferences around the, the nation and there's some really interesting things that they're doing um, to prevent those kinds of injuries. So Dr. Martino was the sponsoring physician that um, for that program. Mary Wilstrup is a, a PICU nurse over at uh, Children's over at Children's and Women's Hospital and she was instrumental in implementing that here in the area too. She went out to lots of different schools and taught them about all the different types of injuries and, and how to prevent and stuff like that. So um, that was an origi the original thought process for the education program here. And then the concussion awareness program was started. So I'll tell you a little bit about how that got started. It actually got started as kind of a pipe dream. So my husband and I were sitting on the couch while he was programming a Moodle module. I'm not sure if you guys know what Moodle is, but it's an LMS system. It's a learning management system that's free. It's free for everyone. And um, so he was programming it for me while I was doing voiceover to teach people about concussions, just to, you know, to tell them what the signs and symptoms are. And, and basically it was just very, very basic. And we were on the couch and that's how it got started. So that's what it was. And it really has evolved now to, um, to a, an actual program that we feel like is imp impacting the lives of our young athletes and coaches. So. Why are we doing this? Originally, why are we doing this? So, of course, our biggest goal is the safety of our players, always, or the safety of our athletes and our youth. So, um, but it's also to increase an athlete's intention to report. So the reason why we took this new method, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit, was to increase their inten intention to report. So, yeah, we know that they, we have all these concussions. And remember I said 80% of them go unreported. So if we could get them to report and tell us what's going on, then we feel like we may be able to treat them better. So that really was the, the kind of the brains behind the program. So we wanted to change the attitudes and the culture surrounding concussions. So it's not just a headache, you know, um, it can have lifelong effects. I'm sure you guys have heard in the NFL recently and, and um, other uh, the baseball league and that kind of thing. Um, they, baseball league just put out um, a couple, I guess it was a couple months ago, that they have to stay out a week now, um, you know, and for, for their different types of concussions and things like that. So everybody is, is kind of making rules and regulations around that. So we really are looking at a culture change for your concussion. So increased concussion knowledge. So we know this is already in place. So part of our goal was to increase concussion knowledge, but we know these kids have heard this over and over and over and over, and probably you guys too. So the signs and symptoms of a concussion are, you know, and so they're like, oh, we already know you could have a headache or you could vomit or you could do this. You know, we already know all that stuff. So that really wasn't our primary intention, but of course we put some of that in the education as well. And the NCAA also requires some form of education for our college students as well. So in 2010, the NCAA actually mandated information about the concussions annually for all of the college athletes. So even when the NCAA mandated it, the athletes surveyed after they were given this education, they could not recollect receiving material at all the very next day. So they didn't even remember. They're like, what? Somebody talked to us about that? What did they even say about that? So, um, so you can see how high of a priority this was in 2010 when that first started. So um, you had inconsistent efficacy of concussion education programs. So these were the handouts that we were talking about. And um, so a lot of schools had some information, but 78% of them actually needed improvement. Now this is on the college level. So this is kind of where it all got started. So NCAA was not happy with that. They were like, we have got to do something different. So they did what they called a Mind Matters Grand Challenge. And that's where we came in. So we decided, we're like, oh, that sounds really interesting. And Mary Wilstrup was actually part of this as well. Um, we, because of her involvement in Think First, we all kind of did it as a team. And we just applied. We're like, you know what? 
we love concussion education. Maybe we could make a difference. So we applied for this challenge and we actually were one of the finalists. So that is how we were able to get funding for the new product that we have now. So it went from my couch Moodle module <laughs> to this NCAA funded education. So that's um, where we got that from. So now I want to tell you all about the concussion awareness program and what it is today and then the future of, of our program and what we hope it achieves in the future. So it is a web-based module. It's really neat because it's easily accessible. So you just go online and go to the website and it all comes up right there. So it's comprehensive within the website. So you have lots of different things that you can get um, in that one website. The students can take it at home so they can do the education at home. The parents can do the education at home, the coaches, all of that. That's why we made it on the computer so that now currently we are going out to the schools because we want to create a partnership with them and want them to know that we're here and we can you know help them if needed but they can do it without us there so you know there's lots of athletes in, in the schools. so you know we try to go out at least once to implement it and then they're able to do it at home after that So what all is involved in the website so we have there's there's the website we have had a recent like overhaul of the program and it's really pretty now. The, some of you picked up some handouts out there and um, it's P2P concussions and we'll talk about what that is in a little bit but this is the website that still goes to it but we also have a new website as well um, that's on the pamphlets that were handed out. But on this website there's neurocognitive testing so there's an option for neurocognitive testing. So what is neurocognitive testing? So basically it's a baseline test that test the athletes where they are neurocognitively before they start playing. Okay, so then once they have a concussion or a probable concussion, we can test them again and see where they are um, as far as healing and that kind of thing. So if, they're, if they do worse on the test, then they may not be ready to go back in. Can we use it only and say that? No, we have to use other means clinically to determine whether they can go back in or not. But it was a good measure for, um, to decide if their concussion was improving or not. So um, we still use neurocognitive testing quite frequently. So um, educational videos, uh, pre and post tests. So the educational video is what we made here at South Alabama. So we used our South athletes that had actually been injured. So they had actually had a concussion um, in the past seasons. And then we do a pre and post test so we can see if their attitudes have changed. We do have some questions on there that are knowledge based and then some are attitude based. So just to see in this scenario, what would you do and see if that changed. Um, there's a sideline assessment tool that I'm going to show you all that I think is really neat. And then concussion clinic information and contacts and then our return to play protocol. And that's really just for the um, athletic trainers and the um, coaches and, and whoever has access to the site so that they know kind of where we're coming from when we're, when we're sending the uh, students back to play. So this is the home page. This is still what the home page looks like. You see the little cap on the brain. So we're putting a cap on concussions. That was kind of our stick, you know. Um, so that's what the home page looks like. And this is our sign in. So we have a player sign in, a coach sign in, and a parent sign in. So that was really nice that we were able to access all of that, all of those stakeholders. Um, the way that they sign in is they get a school code. So when we put your school into the system, it generates a code. So every player that comes in under that school, and I'll show you a little bit more about that on here. So every player that comes in, I'm not attached anymore, okay. Um, so every player that comes in to, um, to the site, they'll put in, like here it says Jags football there so they may have a code for the Jags football team and then they put in that code so each team underneath a certain umbrella of schools will know exactly where their team is and that way you're able to see what players have taken the education and what what players have not which is really great for the schools because of liability and that way they can say you know what we we did all of our education that we were supposed to do for the year all of our players have a green check mark by them and they all did it <laughs> so um, and you can see on here you can see your progress so there's the pre-test and the video and then the post-test on there Uh, right now we are doing high school, um, but we are talking about doing middle schools and stuff too. There are a few middle schools that we have been in contact with that are actually doing the program. Yeah, but it is, it's um, appropriate for those ages. Probably under middle school, the video is not quite appropriate for those ages just because they don't understand exactly the same um, things. 
So the next page is how we keep up with our statistics on how it's going. How is the program going? Is it actually changing attitudes or is it not? Um, do people like it or do they not? Um, I love this part because that way we're able to evaluate our program on a continuing basis. So we evaluate it every time a player takes it, it evaluates the program. So I really like that because it's housed all in the same system so that makes it easier, easy for us to see. Now this is your on-field assessment, which on here is the SCAT 3, we update the SCAT as it's updated um, on the field, but um, this is really cool because you can use your tablet or your phone and pull up the SCAT. Um, now a lot of the athletic trainers are going to have those on, on the sidelines anyway um, because they're prepared with that kind of stuff, but this gives you know people that don't have that, and some schools don't have athletic trainers on the field every single time. So this gives them a good way to be able to quickly assess and say, you know what, this kid doesn't need to go back in. They need to see a physician on Monday, and then we can see when we can get them back in. So the SCAT 3 is used for that, SCAT 5, there's um, several of those. So as they update them, we always update too. So we have the video. This is going to, it's about 10 minutes long, so I want to play it for you. I want you to see it. Let's see. More than 460,000 NCAA student athletes compete in 23 sports every year. And with each tackle, run, throw, flip, slide, or dive, there's a chance of injury, and head injuries can be particularly serious. You've heard the term before, concussions. So what are they? A concussion is a traumatic brain injury caused by a blow to the head, face, or any other part of the body that transmits force to the brain. It can happen to anyone at any time. That means you too. And when you think about sports that cause concussions, don't just stop at football. Concussions can happen in any sport or activity. Cheerleaders, pole vaulters, and other athletes get concussions too. I've had four concussions over the course of 10 months. You would think that me playing softball, me playing a sport where it's not really heard of that two people hit each other in the head, clash each other in the head, like football for instance, where you hear about head injuries all the time, that you wouldn't have a high risk of, of head trauma. But any sport you play, anything you do really, you have to be aware of your head, aware of the position you're, you're putting yourself in. In a concussion, most of the time you don't get knocked out, but that doesn't mean you haven't been injured. A concussion literally shakes your brain and affects how it works. That's serious. What happens to the brain when you get a concussion? Well, your brain bounces around in the skull, and chemical changes occur in the brain, making it more vulnerable to further injury. That means once you get your first concussion, you increase your chances of getting another one. So what's it feel like to have a concussion? Well, not all symptoms happen to everyone, but early symptoms include possibly losing consciousness, headache, feeling dazed or dizzy, vomiting, memory loss, feeling like you were in a fog, and loss of balance. As soon as I went up to head the ball, the girl accidentally headed my head instead of the ball, and that's all I remember about that game. Like after she headed me, I don't remember anything else after that. I mean, I I blacked out for a little bit. It was probably like a couple seconds. Like it, it wasn't it wasn't terrible, but um, when I did wake up, I couldn't see. Like it was blurry. Why do I feel like this? Why can't I remember things? Like why don't I remember anything after my concussion? Like that that's what I struggled with the most. The first one that I had was completely different than the second one. Um, the first one, neither were very um, overly dramatic. Uh, I never lost consciousness or anything to that extent, um, but they were both completely different. The first one uh, was a little bit more dizziness. Uh, second one really would, didn't really feel a lot of those symptoms. It's important to remember not everyone shares the same symptoms, but if you're having any symptoms at all, here are some steps you should take. Then let the experts make the call. Report any symptoms right away. See a doctor or athletic trainer. Come out of the game for further monitoring. All athletes are taught to be tough. They don't want to let their teammate down. They don't want to let their coach down. Um, and so when they do have that occur, they tend to hide it. Um, they're not going to help you know, our team by being 50% or 30% or even, even 20%. Uh, if you do have any symptoms at all, report it. Uh, it's not worth uh, any kind of severe brain damage down the road for you to play one more play or play one more game. 
With a concussion, you may not feel any symptoms immediately and maybe not even for several hours. But if you received a blow or jolt to your head or upper body, you need to get out of the game and get checked out. Even if you really want to keep playing, let's say it's an important game or it's your final season, it may not be the best thing for you or your team. Remember, always report your symptoms to an athletic trainer, a doctor on the field, your coach, or even your teammates. Once a student athlete has been identified as to having a concussion or possibly having a concussion, we immediately pull them to the side. Uh, we take their gear away from them. We pull them from play. Uh, and we, are, we do a really quick evaluation, which is a sideline evaluation, which is a very simple test, uh, asking them to do some recall uh, questions, uh, asking them to do just some light functioning, uh, and then we can make a determination if they have been concussed. If they are concussed, we immediately pull them from play. They are not to return that day, and then a further evaluation will come later with the medical team. Most student athletes are able to return to play, uh, but there are circ certain circumstances where if you don't report those symptoms immediately and you take a second hit, uh, whether it's a minor hit or a major hit, uh, as the concussions progress they get worse and worse and worse um, so that you can actually have long-term effects that will affect just your quality of life. Remember, it's better to miss one game than the whole season or even your entire athletic career. So listen to the experts and let yourself recover because going back too soon potentially puts you at risk for further injury. And there are emotional symptoms connected with concussions as well such as irritability, depression, anxiety, difficulty sleeping, and even anger. Everything like looking up at the sun or every time I looked into the light, just talking to people sometimes really gave me a headache. You know, I was just very irritated. Sitting in a dark room, not um, really talking very much, not really wanting to do anything. And it wasn't because I was told that I had to stay in that area. That's because I felt the best when I was there. Going out, bright lights, a lot of people talking, it, it just made me upset, made me irritable, made me angry. A concussion might result in a drop in grades and school performance. They can also cause long-term physical damage, including persistent headaches, difficulty with balance, light and noise sensitivity, and difficulty concentrating. You know, think about it back then when I was playing, you don't take it as serious because, I mean, you don't, you just, you're going to class, you're practicing, you're lifting, getting your bell rung and having you know, the concussions and throwing up afterwards and stuff like that. It's just all part of it. You don't really think of it. Looking back now, in the long term, it's just not worth the side effects. Um, you know, especially the ones I'm having with insomnia, depression, anxiety, uh, not being able to remember things. Um, so I think it's important to go ahead and take yourself out of the game. Today, we are more aware of the damage a concussion can cause. This awareness and concern for a player's welfare is shared by coaches, trainers, and teammates. So how do you create a supportive team environment? Encourage teammates to report if they are injured. Report the injury for them if they cannot or will not. And remember, you are reporting for the team. Some of the guys noticed I was off and I couldn't talk really. I was, you know, bothered I had a migraine that I thought it was. And they called over to the trainers, they came and got me and I, had a concussion. When you have that type of support, when you have that type of community around you, it makes it a lot easier to come up here and put yourself at risk each and every day when you know that the guy or girl that's playing beside you has your back when you say, hey, I don't feel well. We obviously uh, want to take care of you first. You have to report to us when you have any type of symptoms and most of them don't want to tell you. Uh, they, want, they want to stay in the game, but listen, uh, your brain uh, is something that, um, that obviously is very sensitive down the road. You've got to take care of it now. So if you have any symptoms at all, report it to us, report it to the trainer. We will get you out of the game and make sure we check on you. It may be frustrating, but there's no standard treatment or time frame for getting over a concussion. And while you've probably done neurocognitive testing before the season, you'll have to do it again after your concussion. Because medications cannot fix a concussion, what can you expect for treatment? A doctor visit, rest in time, and neurocognitive testing. After a concussion, when can you play again? There are five gradual steps to follow to help athletes safely return to play, provided you're not still having symptoms. Step one, light aerobic activity. Step two, sport-specific exercise. Step three, heavy non-contact activity. Step four, 
full contact practice. Step five, return to competition. I had to do light training for about a week, but after, after I first got my concussion, I was able to play that next game. I didn't miss a game. They kind of ease you back into things, you know, especially if you have a lot of time off, you ease your way back into, until they see that you're back to yourself, you know, your normal self, you back physically playing the way you play. It came back that I had some some side effects that, that we were pretty concerned about, so decided that the rest of the season I was gonna play. Be sure to listen to your body as well. Remember, you're the ultimate boss of when you were ready to play again. What happens if you return too early? You risk further injury to yourself. You risk letting the team down because you cannot play at your best. And you risk not playing again if re-injured. If you do not report your concussions and you do not take immediate action uh, to make sure that you are properly cared for, for the long term, you could end up not only losing your game, not only losing your season, but you could lose certain sections of your life and how to function as, as a human being. Sports is, is, is awesome. Everybody loves it. It's a, it's a game you want to play, but in long term, I mean, there's a lot more than just sports. You know, you're going to have to live a lot more time. You have family, kids, and you know, one day, you know, your kids are going to be like, Daddy, you know, why did you do this? Or, you know, so you really just want to make the right decision at that time, which is, it is hard, but um, it is very important, I think. Right now, you're a college athlete, that's the short term. You're a, a athlete in high school, you're travel ball, what, whatever your, your sport is. That's very short term. The long term is having the use of your brain for a job, for your family, for everyday life. Bottom line is, it's uh, we want these young men and young women to make sure that uh, they take care of themselves, that we take care of them, and that they're safe. And, and uh, that we don't want to have care, them to carry any long-term injury uh, into the rest of their life. Okay, so that was the video. So that's what they see when they log into the program and take the pretest. So we can see what they know already. And then, um, and then after the video, they take that same test again to see if they would react differently to the different situations that, that are presented in the question. So, so CAP in action, what are we doing now? Where are we right now? So um, currently we're in Mobile County and Baldwin County. So we have educated over a thousand athletes so far in the high school setting. Um, in, from 2016 until now. So the University of South Alabama athletes, it was a few from each team, um, like you saw in the video, um, and then more and more came after that. That's, those were the original players. Those were the ones that we first did the education for. So um, we, that's where the pilot study was completed and to just to make sure it was effective. And uh, so they got to participate first. So that was a lot of fun. So how did it end up? How were the results? What did we find in the pilot and in the first year? So I'm not gonna bore you with a bunch of research stuff, but we, uh, we did have statistically significant results in the attitudes before versus after the, um, the educational video. So what we did find is that after listening to that video and learning from other athletes, that they may react differently to a situation after hearing what the long-term effects were and things like that. Both males and females showed that same difference. There was only a slight increase in the knowledge, but remember we talked about, we already knew that. We already knew there was only gonna be a slight improvement because they already know stuff. Their score was already so high. So because we kept ta we talk about it and we talk about it and we talk about it. So they already knew all the, the concussion symptoms that we asked them. So they, they pretty much, they got a little bit higher, but it wasn't statistically significant. So, and here's a pretty picture of the results. <laughs> So how's it going? How, is, how has it been? I guess a good way to put it would be slowly but surely. So as we integrate into the school systems and, and all of the athletes and the recreational athletes and all of that, it is slow but sure. So, um, you know, they're inviting us in and um, we have had a few limitations, of course. So um, computer availability, anytime you do something online, right, there's, there's all kinds of IT issues. I don't know about you guys, but computers are not my specialty. So um, <laughs> they are my husband's, thank goodness. But um, so anyway, they are not my specialty. So there's always going to be some sort of technology technical difficulties that we're going to encounter. There are some schools that don't have full computer labs. 
So they don't have enough computers for everyone um, to take the computer program. Um, some schools have computers for every one of their students that they get to take home. So all schools are different, you know, so that was a limitation. So some of the schools that didn't have enough computers for everybody, we would just do waves. We would just do, okay, well, we'll do 20 of them now, and we'll do 20 of them 30 minutes later, and we'll just keep doing it until we get all of them, okay? So, um, but now that we can do it at home and that kind of thing, that should help that too, because if they have a computer at home that they're able to do homework and stuff like that on, that should help a lot. Audio, uh, they have to have headphones. So we have a lot of high school students that wear beats walking down the hallway, right? You guys have probably seen them. They walk down the street, they walk down the sidewalk with their beats on, okay? So we know that some of them have those, but some of them don't. Not everyone has an iPhone, okay? So not everyone has, uh, um, you know, a Samsung phone that comes with those little headphones. So, um, so that was a thing that we had to consider as well. So we started, you know, bringing audio with us so that we could provide that to some of the students. So, and of course, you know, our schools are trying to be really safe with the computer access for the students so they block things like YouTube and Facebook and things like that so we were blocked at first so the first few times that we went to Mobile County Public Schools they were like it would not come up and we're like what in the world you know and the IT got involved and they're like sorry guys we were blocking y'all this whole time you know and it was because they were just trying to make sure it was safe so we're happy that those things are implemented in the school system but now they know about us so it's so it's okay <laughs> so um, time constraints it takes takes about 20 minutes. You know, you just saw the video, so that takes about 10 minutes. And then to do the pre and post test and fill out the demographic information is, an, you know, is another little bit of time. So about 20 minutes for the total education. So some of the athletes have already taken the neurocognitive testing, which takes anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. Um, some of them have already done that. So. Our program is, is mostly based on education, but we, do, we can provide neurocognitive testing as well. But some of the schools already have you know, impact testing or whatever kind of testing, and they're able to use whatever they're used to using. So um, that time can, can or may, may or may not be um, within the 20 minutes. So um, community and school support, we always need that, you know, so we, we've been out in the school systems, we have been to board meeting after board meeting, and, and we, we do have a lot of support from the school system, which is wonderful. So it is really hard to integrate yourself into the school system because it is, it is a, a closed system. But um, the more streamlined that we made the program and um, the more it decreased liability as far as not educating versus educating these athletes, um, both parents and athletes, um, it really has helped. So we have a lot of support from our local schools schools and communities. So the medical community, I think this is really neat, comprehensive interdisciplinary support that we've had all over the, the city, all over the counties. Um, we've, we've spread the word in, in other states as well. So we've gone to numerous conferences and, and helped out with that. Our athletic directors, so started out against the effort, and I hate to say against the effort because they never were against it. They have the safety of their players at the very top of their priority list. but. We don't want to take away practice time. We don't want to take away, you know, time that we have them on the field or in the weight rooms and stuff like that. So this was really helpful to them once they saw how easy it is um, for them to complete it and have their athletes all educated at one time and done. So once they saw that, we really had a lot of support from them because of the consistency. And also they were like, well, what are we going to do when there is a concussion? So this provided them with someone to call, with someone to, okay, I will see your, your, um, your athlete and make sure that we're getting them back in as soon as we can, safely, of course. So just a little bit more info on how we're different. So all of these different systems, uh, Brain 101 out of Oregon, Oregon State University did a huge um, concussion <coughs> Uh, education platform at the very beginning. They were like one of the first ones and it was amazing. It was really, really mm -hmm. good. Brain 101 is, a, is kind of a spin-off of that and it's really good too. It's very, very good. Barrow Brain Book out of Arizona, Heads Up from the CDC. All of these are really good programs. But how is ours different? Ours is different because it's peer-to-peer. And what that means is teen to teen, or athlete to athlete. So I can sit up here all day long. I talk to adolescents a lot. I go to the schools and I talk about athletic, um, 
um, excuse me, adolescent sexual health. I go to the schools and talk about um, adolescent nutrition and all of those things. I can sit up here all day long and talk to them and say concussions are terrible. Make sure you say make sure you say something if you hit your head and they're like oh, okay whatever and they don't remember what I said two seconds later. But when you have an athlete that's actually been out there and done those things and actually has hit their head and came out of the game and actually got to go back in and finish out the season or maybe like your the softball player was like you know what. It just wasn't happening for me this year. I just wasn't getting all the way better. You know, it, it means a lot more when it comes from them. And the research shows that, that peer-to-peer -peer is the way to go. So, so that's, how we, that's how we came up with the concept of the education. So to provide that change in culture, we found that peer-to-peer -peer really was the best way. The team environment, to kind of build that team environment like we talked about before. And not just knowledge, but attitude. So at first we, we came up with the first one that I was telling you about, the Moodle, and we were like, oh, concussions, it's a headache, it's nausea, vomiting, that kind of thing. And then when we incorporated the attitude is really when we saw the change and the, the good change um, for the outcome. So, and then, of course, we have constant evaluation for, for our program, which is, which is great. So that way we're, we know how to you know, change it for the future. So what's in the future for our CAP program? We hope a lot. We hope a whole lot for our program. So uh, we want to do more schools, of course. We want to touch as many athletes as possible, as many coaches, as many athletic trainers, um, as many parents as possible. Um, something that's really amazing is that there's talk of a comprehensive concussion clinic here at USA, which would be really, really nice because we could have our athletes come in and they see everyone that they need to see about their concussion to get them as healthy as possible, as quickly as possible in one place. So that, that is an amazing thing that we're talking about. And then, of course, ongoing, what we really want to do is continue to break the barriers for reporting concussions and improve the lives of our young athletes. So that's the main goal, I guess, of, of the whole CAP program. And that's where we are today. Thank you all so much for coming. That's a good question. It's, actually, it's free. It's completely free. Mm -hmm. So um, to, to get a login, all we have to do is, is talk to them and, and you know, kind of um, go back and forth about how we can provide support and that kind of thing. And then um, and it's free. So the neurocognitive testing that we provide is free, um, but a lot of schools, like I said, already have purchased packages from Impact or whoever um, else. So we, um, but the one that we provide is actually free as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Are some individuals more subject to genetic well, there is a um, predisposition if you've already had a concussion before. So we do know that athletes that have had a concussion in, in maybe a past season or in this season are more likely to get a concussion. For, so there is a predisposition in that way. Right, yeah. And so, yeah, once they start getting one, then, you know, sometimes they are, you know, a little bit more susceptible. And then, you know, there's not a steadfast rule, but once they've had so many, sometimes we, we're less likely to let them go back in after that. And could that have been that she wasn't ready to go back after the first one, that she... Well, you know, it, it could be because, you know, your, your balance can be off. That is one way that we um, test for how you're doing after a concussion. And, and these athletic trainers really watch them super close. So I'm sure that she was ready to go back in. But, um, but you know, you can't be 100%. We can't see what's going on inside of there, you know. So you can't be 100% sure every time. And some players are just more rough than other players, right? So there's always um, that... Uh, the bull that's out there, you know, that just kind of what I call my husband a bull in a china cabinet, you know, and they just kind of run out and that's how they are and that's how they play aggressively. So they are, you know, of course, more likely to. Yes, ma'am. I know you're the adult, um, like, league sports community here in Mobile. Are concussions common in any of those groups? I mean, do they tend to be worse if you're older or younger? Um, we don't, we haven't actually, we're, we haven't touched that population yet, but we know concussions are very common in adults because of the NFL and, and the um, professional baseball leagues and professional hockey leagues, so it absolutely does happen. Um, research shows that the younger you are, the worse the lifetime effects are um, with concussions. So I'm sure you've, you've heard the great debate um, in the current research about um, how young is too young to start playing soccer or to start playing football. And 
and and that still is the great debate. So, um, but yeah, they do say the younger that you are, the the possibility of lifetime problems is is more. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank <laughs> you.